You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Sarah. And I'm Jennifer. And this is episode 206. Today's podcast is brought to you by Elite Science. Unlock your dog's full potential with a unique competitive edge solution, 1TDC. 1-tetradecanol complex is a patented blend of unique fatty acid oils designed to safely and effectively keep joints and muscles at their best to maximize performance and shorten recovery time. 1TDC is the next generation of fatty acids and is used by many current and past national agility champions and world team members. All of our listeners will automatically qualify for a great 1TDC special offer by purchasing online at BDA1TDC.com. That's BDA, the number one, TDC.com. Today's podcast is also brought to you by HitItBoard.com. HitItBoard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A-frame? The HitItBoard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A-frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hititboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hititboard.com. Well, today we don't even need a special guest on the podcast because our very own co-host Jennifer is back from the Agility World Championship and we have three lessons from the Agility World Championship that Jennifer is going to share with us today. Jennifer and I both attended the event. Jennifer was part of Team USA. I attended the event as spectator and media person. And uh, we are now both back in the States, home from Sweden. And Jennifer, first, let's just say congratulations on your amazing showing at the Agility World Championship. Thank you so much. It's uh, not even been two weeks yet. Still a bit surreal about the whole thing, Uh, you know, kind of processing it and, and still trying to realize how amazing Swift was, how great of a weekend we really had. Yeah, so Jennifer um, competed with Swift, the Sheltie, in the medium height class and came home with the individual silver medal, so vice champion of the Agility World Championship for 2018. And I kind of want to lead up to this amazing accomplishment that you had with Swift by realizing what an amazing year you have been having. So if we go back just about one year, you won steeplechase with Swift. You got second in Grand Prix with Pink. You won Westminster with Pink. You won the National Agility Championship with Pink. You won on to Team USA with Swift at tryouts. You medaled with Swift and Pink at WAO and Games. And then you come home with the individual silver medal at the Agility World Championship. So congratulations on an incredible year finishing with this amazing accomplishment of bringing home that individual medal. Yeah, it's really been a fantastic year, Um, you know, especially when you kind of rattle them off like that and list them like that. It's felt like a good year. The dogs have been doing great. Uh, You know, training has gone well. Dogs have stayed healthy. Um, And we still got two more big events coming up just a couple weeks away from USDA Nationals, followed by uh, the UKI US Open. And uh, hopefully we can keep our momentum going to finish out 2018. Awesome. Well, let's get to the three lessons that we promised everybody about the Agility World Championship. So lessons that we are bringing home from the event. And the first is that preparation is event specific. So let's talk a little bit about how you prepared for this event and then how other people can take kind of the same ideas in preparation for the events that they have coming up in their careers. So for the Agility World Championships, one of the big, uh, you know, the big announcements that they make prior to the event is who's going to be judging. Uh, they usually do it at least a year in advance or, you know, maybe maybe 10, uh, nine months before. And that is the start of the prep. That is the point where you say, okay, these are the judges. Let's start following them. Uh, the first thing I did was friend those two judges on Facebook. And as silly as that sounds, they're very public and very open uh, with the courses that they do at other events. And so it's very common for different countries to hire those judges for their tryout events. So if a judge is going to have a specific trend, it only makes sense that we include those trends at tryouts to get the best participants who can handle that. So once you know, once you start following what trends they're putting up, following their courses, watching videos, um, you know, a big thing was trying to figure out exactly what these judges like knowing what they tend to do over and over again allows you to modify and adjust your training plan. The one judge specifically liked putting a tunnel under a dog walk 
uh, and more of a perpendicular line to the dog walk. So not like we're used to seeing in the States where they're parallel and then just a small bend, like a discrimination, um, but more perpendicular to it, where you really need to trust the tunnel send or have be there for the tunnel entry and then get around the dog walk, want to run around the dog walk uh, to get downstream. So that was something that we did a lot of training for. Swift and I did a lot of training for this um, summer and fall, which paid off because we saw that challenge. So in the medium individual standard, that was a challenge we saw right at the beginning of the course. Uh, one of the one of the good laughs of my run as I almost fell into the uh, dog walk there as I was trying to get around it. So knowing what the event is going to be formatted like knowing what the who the judges are, what those judges like, helps you feel more prepared. You can expect, you can anticipate, and then when you see that challenge, feel really ready for it. I think the other thing, looking at kind of preparation for any event, not, you know, that's kind of what I did specific to the AWC, is, you know, really making training choices based on your goals. So for, for me, because I know the caliber of those courses was going to be different, a little more running, a little bit more length than what I can usually train on or trial on here in the States. Pretty much for most of the summer and fall, I elected to give up some of the local shows or give up um, a day or two of the shows in order to be able to use that day for training. So we uh, often had Sunday, what we call Sunday training, and we would set up courses from the judges and run courses from the judges. But that was always, you know, two, two and a half, three hour event. So if I showed on Sunday, it would be taxing on me, taxing on the dog, be tired. So I was doing a lot of giving up the local trials, the AKC trials, the USA trials on Sunday in order to allow myself to put my time and put my energy into preparation for the courses. So I think, you know, being a little bit more goal oriented as far as what you're looking for, um, I, you know, I think this is this was a way to go for international course training. Um, but if, you know, your goals say they lay in, Uh, agility invitational. Maybe you do want to go to an event, uh, go to a trial, go to um, a local show and really make the goal running four for four, you know, whatever it takes. Don't try to, you know, win every class or don't take that extra risk, but really prepping in a way that makes sense for what your goals in the short term and long term are. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, we hear a lot that, it's hard to be competitive internationally when you live in the States because the courses are so different. Have you heard that before, Jennifer? Oh, yes. You, you see it a lot, um, you know, a lot on social media. Um, and, and I will be the first to admit that for many years I used that um, as an excuse. I mean, at the time, I didn't think of it as an excuse, but I look back on it and I would, I kind of was like, oh, well, you know, we'll never be as good as them. Our, we don't get to train those courses. We'll never be as great. We don't get to practice those skills. Our courses don't allow us to take that into the ring. And at the time, I felt like I was just stating the truth. The reality of it is it was a nice excuse for why I wasn't on the team, why I wasn't doing better, why I wasn't out there winning. But, uh, you know, I think one of the big things to realize is other countries are having the same issue. You know, you go to Canada, you go to Great Britain, um, you know, even we've heard from from Sweden that their regular courses that they're running on the weekend aren't the same as what the Agility World Championships has. So this is not a, a, a trend that is unique to the States. So any of the handlers that are wanting to compete at that level and uh, do well at that level, regardless of our country, they're having to put the extra work in, they're having to set up the courses, they're having to go to bigger arenas. So, you know, I, I think um, that's definitely something we hear. And it, it maybe just means a little bit more effort than just showing up at a trial, having somebody else build your course, walking it and running it. Absolutely. That's exactly the point that I wanted to make. And, you know, when we look at the results, uh, you've basically kind of debunked that a little bit, right? Because you go to the event this year with Swift. By the way, Swift's first time ever at this event, a very young dog, and you come home with an individual silver. When we think about other countries that have similar um, differences in in their home country course design versus the Agility World Championship, uh, we hear that a lot in Great Britain. And you have somebody like Dave Munnings on the podium this year earning bronze in the individual large category. Coming out of Canada, you have Jessica Patterson putting down a phenomenal second place run in the jumpers uh, large dog with her very, very young dog Lux. So I think that this argument that we cannot do well is absolutely debunked. 
you know, do we have different obstacles than other countries? Yes, we do. But we also may have some advantages that they don't have. So I love that you say that it used to be an excuse and now you just are focused on what you need to do to make the success that you're looking for happen and make the, making those choices in your um, training and in how you approach your schedule and things like that. All right, so moving on from preparation, let's talk about execution and mental management. So the key takeaway that we have here from the Agility World Championship is that mental management starts well before the big event. We've talked in the past about visualization and how it's critical for your performance, but I'd like to focus this aspect of mental management on how your training can actually impact your mental game at the big event. Yeah, I think this is something that, you know, I've only really thought about more consciously uh, relatively recently. Using Swift as an example in a situation from the Agility World Championships, his start line is, his start line is not ideal. His start line makes me nervous. Um, I have to manage it. I have to keep my eyes on him. Um, And I always just kind of think, okay, I, you know, I, I need to do a better job working that, training that, keeping an eye on it. Uh, But really what it led into is it led into quite a bit of trouble on the course for anybody who did the AWC experience. And I did my analysis on my very first run because it was my first time, uh, my first run at his first AWC. I wasn't really sure how he was going to react to the crowd and the environment. So I was very nervous about my start line. He was fine on his start line. He did not release before I told him. He allowed me to lead out. We did not have trouble with the 15-second rule, but we did end up faulting at obstacle four because of the start line. I was so nervous to take my eyes off of him that I did not look up to see spatially where I was. So I released him. Now he's coming at me full speed. The run has started. And when I turned a glance up to see where I was, I wasn't quite where I needed to be. And this is not typical of what I do at home. Typically at home, I would look up, I would be get, getting spatially aware, and then I would look back and release them. So here's a situation where my lack of start line stay, and it could be any trained skill, really affected my mental game. I was nervous about it. I was worried about it. I didn't get where I needed to be. My visualization and, and my spatial awareness was affected and, and led to a fault. The reverse then happened in our our final round, our medium individual standard, there was a very tricky element off of the dog walk. And the dog walk is an obstacle that I'm extremely confident in. I have a two on swap. I have a solid two on swap. It's not one that he pushes me at in trials. It's not one that I've allowed for a lot of quick and early releases. So as, um, you know, Nancy came up to me and said, do you think you're going to be able to do, do this? Are you worried about this? You know, be careful for the dogs that aren't going to hold their two on, two off. I said, oh, yeah, that's fine. We got this. That'll be a piece of cake. Um, and it actually was one section of the course where in the walkthrough, didn't really walk a whole bunch. I had my plan. I was happy with my plan. I was able to move on. And then in execution, it went great. So I think it was a real testament to the idea that your trained skills, your performance, your um, your training really can affect your mental game um, and that the two are, are very correlated. So when you have a weakness on something, you can carry that into the walkthrough. You may, you, know, you may be nervous about that part. You may spend too much time of your eight minutes obsessing over that obstacle or that area that you know isn't as strong as it should be. And it's really nice. It's really helpful for your mental game and for your confidence and for your strategy to be able to just go out there and say, yep, I can do that. I have an independent teeter. I have great weave pull entries. I have good backsides and make decisions based on what the course really needs, not based on your strengths and weaknesses. So the dog training aspect and the mental management, which I think sometimes are looked at as two different parts, but the better the dog training, the more confidence you have, that can give you a huge boost for your mental game. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think that most people who struggle with nerves, they can probably pinpoint some things that are contributing to those nerves. They're not sure that their dog's going to hold the contact or hold the start. And and that kind of spins them off into this, you know, bundle of nerves. And so I think this is a really great point for those people because a lot of times you don't really know where to start on how to reduce your nerves. And to say, okay, well, where are you weak from an agility standpoint? 
and go work on those weak areas so that they're no longer a weakness, uh, that's a much more tangible approach to nerves for a lot of people. There was one other thing that you had mentioned to me that I thought was a really great point that I hadn't really thought of. And that was that you learned about mental management techniques very early in your agility career. And I think that it's a really good point that you made um, to me when we were just talking that most people try to address mental management once they have a problem and they're you know, totally stressed out and they can't uh, make it through a course and they're feeling sick to their stomach. And it's so much harder to add that mental aspect in when you're already a bundle of nerves than it is to have some notions of uh, strategies for dealing with nerves at the very beginning of your agility career. Yeah, absolutely. It kind of goes to the phrase, old habits die hard. And, And I think For me, I learned the mental management as I was learning the sport. So they both kind of came side by side and grew together. What I see happen with a lot of people, they they start agility as a hobby. They start for fun. Then they do a local show. Then they do a regional. And, you know, there's three or four years into the sport and they decide, okay, I want to go to nationals. I want to go to a big event. And so therefore, now I'm going to start working on my mental game because I'm going to a bigger event. The thing you got to remember is you already potentially have two, three, four years of bad habits on your mental game that now you have to go back and you have to try to relearn. You have to try to rework. So I think, and it's hard to tell a beginner this when they think, okay, well, I'm just coming in um, as a hobbyist. But I think, you know, one thing for newbies out there that would be listening or instructors out there is try to integrate a little bit of that mental management into the very beginning of the sport, the lower levels of the sport. You know, in a beginner's class, in the first time they do a little six obstacle course at graduation, have them, you know, close their eyes and tell you what the course is or walk you through their plan or visualize long before they're even trialing so that they're starting to get some of those techniques and they can learn the mental part as they go rather than trying to break those old habits. And then exactly as you said, we're not waiting until we're already uh, nervous to practice and implement those. And I think that's kind of a separate thing I see a lot is local shows, I'm not nervous, no big deal. So there's no need to practice mental management. You know, so we're going weekend after weekend after weekend without the need to practice it. And just like anything else, if you're not practicing it, you lose the skills, the skills get rusty, they don't get as strong. So say you go to three big events a year. Well, if the only time you're practicing those mental management skills are those three times a year, it's no different than if you only trained weed pole three times a year. So I think some people wait until they're ultra nervous to think about mental management when it's really something we want to practice on a uh, weekly basis, a, a monthly basis, day in and day out, let it become part of our routine so that we're more comfortable with it when we do then see it at those bigger events. Fabulous advice. All right. Now, our our third lesson from the Agility World Championship and from Jennifer Crank is that the key to success is better handling and better dog training. So tell us a little bit about how these ideas come together in something like the Agility World Championship. Yeah, this is something I've talked a lot about recently with students and in seminars, and I've, I've kind of followed the evolution over the last 18 to 24 months. But I feel like we've gotten to a really big shift where people think the solution to everything, the key to success is to outhandle the dog, right? Um, use, a, use a move here, run faster here, get there, you know, here, let me give you this band-aid, put your hand here or rotate like this. And, you know, oh, well, you have to be young and fast or, or whatever. You have to be tall and athletic to get these things done. But if we really break things down and look at them, and if somebody said, you know, what was the one skill you, you want to work on? You know, you went to the world championships, you watched the best of the best. What's the one thing you come home really wanting to work on? I'll be the first to tell you, it's not a fancy handling move. It's dog training. It's obstacle performance. It's independent weave poles. It's trusting your teeter and having a rock solid teeter. It's having a verbal backside and not just when you're right there three inches away, but can you send to the backside from 10 or 12 feet away? Um, And I think, you know, one of the things people need to understand that it really is a balance of the two that you cannot outhandle everything. Yeah, if you are flat out faster than your dog, you may be able to get away with a lot by just outhandling your dog. 
But if you have a dog with speed, if you have a dog who is faster than you, you are going to need the dog training to complement and go with the handling. There's only so much that your speed and your location can get you there for. And even if you watch some of these handlers, you can say, well, they're always up there at the weasels. They are there. You know, your, your theory doesn't make sense because Tobias is always at the weasel entry or Jessica is always there for a backside. Look a few obstacles before that. Look three or four obstacles earlier and ask yourself, how did they get there? They didn't get there on sheer speed. I can, I can tell you that Lux is faster than Jessica uh, just on, on their ground speed. But how she got up there is she had some incredibly trained skill leading up to that. So she had a, you know, beautiful running threadle at a distance. You know, she was able to do it with speed. She was able to do it far, farther away. And that's what got her up there for the weave poles. So I think, you know, the big thing that I would say as far as big takeaways is I didn't, I didn't see any new or fancy handling. You know, I always like to sit in the stands, even though I'm a competitor and watch and see what's on the cutting edge. You know, what are, what are other parts of the world doing? What are they doing that we're missing? And, and I don't think the solution wasn't handling, you know, maybe, maybe three, four years ago, but now everybody's caught up and we're back to switching back to better dog training. Um, I'd say for me specifically, it's weave poles. I, I got to get some of that independence that you see these uh, other handlers have with their weave pole independence because, you know, if I have to be up there for the weave entry, you can't make it downstream. Or if you have to shape, you know, and you have something technical before, you may not be able to get up there to do it. So I think really starting to shift some importance back on dog training and how the two of them really go hand in hand. Yeah, I 100% agree. It is it is just not there is not a handler out there that can just use handling to get through some of the courses that we saw at this past event uh, without having some extremely well-trained skills. And, you know, probably every handler has some gaps so that they choose, you know, like for for the Jessica example, she has this amazing threadle at a, at a distance and that allowed her to really support a backside that, that got a lot of other handlers. Uh, there were some other handlers that were much closer to the dog on the threadle, but then they were doing that same backside where she was up close. They were doing it from, like you said, 15 feet away. So, you know, there's always some skill that is allowing people, you know, as you said, to get to the spots that they're getting. So um, I think that that's something that we're all seeing. I, I've seen it on on Facebook already, people making the same point. Like it is, it is about the independence and those are the skills that we're going to start working on starting right now for next year. Absolutely. I got to get those weave holes trained. That's right. And I do not at all think that this is um, specific to the Agility World Championship. So the, it may be at an extreme there, but I think in every organization, every you know, major event that, that people may have um, a desire to do that may be uh, coming up, you know, a Nationals, uh, Westminster, these, these big events that people are preparing for all year long, kind of the highlights of their career, there are going to be spots where you need independence in key spots to uh, be able to get through the entire course. And like we, you know, tying it right back into that mental management to also put you at ease so that you know that you can handle anything that comes up uh, at a particular event um, that you've prepared for that event and the skill set required for that event. Absolutely. All right. Well, once again, congratulations on your amazing performance. And uh, we look forward to seeing how the rest of 2018 goes for you. Uh, Thank you so much. We'll keep you posted. And that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Elite Science, Hitaboard.com, and NTI Global. Fall in love with our agility products. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com for the widest selection of dog agility tunnels for both competition and backyard training. Known for free shipping, more options, high quality products, and low prices, NTI Global has got you covered. They also offer tamer and anchor weight bags along with a full line of accessories and agility storage solutions. Need your agility gear in a hurry? Don't forget to check the in-stock selection. Visit shop.ntiglobal.com and use promo code PRODUCTS18 for 5% savings off today. Promo code good through 1031 2018. Happy training.
Hey, Dad, have you seen my sunglasses? No, son, have you seen my dad glasses? <laughs>